Psalms 138 is where we're going to spend our time today. Uh, the book of Psalms, chapter 138, uh, it is uh, the lectionary passage for today. Uh, and I am uh, compelled by this passage, particularly as we continue to think about what does it mean for us to lean into a season of refreshing. What does it mean for us to take seriously that the idea of refreshing is not just about uh, internal uh, um, uh, restarting, an internal renewal per se, but it can also be about uh, the opportunity to renew one's mind, to allow our thinking and our framework, that which allows us to make sense of the world in which we live, it allows us to be able to align ourselves to the original ways of God's purposes in creation. And so this is, I think, a, a, a passage that sticks out for me in this regard because I find it uh, to be uh, both uh, the kind of confluence, if you will, of David uh, writing this prayer, a song and a confession all into one. And if you are like me, there are moments in my life as I am seeking out rest and healing and refreshing that sometimes I need prayer. Sometimes I need to sing. I need to uh, meditate on the spiritual song. Sometimes I need to make confession and repentance. Uh, I need to acknowledge the presence of my enemies, but also the, the, the seriousness of God's delivering power. That in our journey, uh, all of these things will come together. All of these things will help solidify our journey uh, through this life and certainly our walk with the Almighty God. And so Psalms 138, uh, Brother David is, is giving us one of his uh, more prominent uh, uh, gifts of, of, of song, confession, and prayer. And I want to offer this to you and I as we uh, make our, our journey further into a year of refreshing um, in the year 2022. Verse number one of Psalms 138 says, I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I sing your praise. I, 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 I love this idea whenever David or some of the ancient writers speak that although they believe that there is only one true God, they are constantly cognizant about the presence of idols or gods with a small g, right? That the supremacy of God, the supremacy of the Almighty, the, the singularity of this God who is worthy to be worshipped in their lives is always juxtaposed over and against the small gods that are often vying for their loyalty. David says, I'm going to give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before all the other idols, all the other claims, all the other loyalties that are being, um, uh, that are asking for my uh, allegiance, before even those gods, I will sing your praise. Verse number two, I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted your name and your word above every day. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. And all the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty God perceives from far away. For though I walk in the midst of trouble, God, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand and your right hand delivers me. Verse number eight is, is, is the, the bedrock of today's message. The Lord will fulfill the Lord's purpose for me. I love the old King James Version says, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, it endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Yes, do not forsake the work 
of your hands. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. Let us say thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to speak from the topic uh, simply all hands on deck. All hands on deck. Death. Father, bless the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please allow the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy may rest on me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll say, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of the way say amen, amen, and amen. All hands on deck. Now, you know, this passage uh, has a powerful anthropomorphic attribution when it talks about, in verse number eight, David's plea to God, do not forsake the work of your hands. This idea that God's hands are at work in the world, that God's hands are at work through us that God's hands are at work in us and on us. It is one of the most endearing and enduring promises that ought to give you and I a certain sense of both uh, joy and at times uh, a little bit of reverence, if you will. That God is an hands-on kind of God. God is not absent. God is not an observer on the sidelines. That the psalmist writes very plainly, God, I expect you not to forsake the work of your own hands. And I believe that it is so important for you and I to hold on to this idea that God is at work in and through and on us and all of history, if you will, through the work of God's own hands. Now, in a society that is spinning out of control, a society where harm is being caused and terror is constantly being unleashed all around us, I want you to know that as we labor to rest, as we've been talking about, as we uh, literally live in rest and peace, and, and as we figure out ways to find the secret place where God can work on us, the secret place where we can have the resets of our heart, of our mind and our spirit. I want you to know that part of the laboring to rest is us holding fast to certain truths, that God's hands are at work among us, that even in the moments where we continue to see the deaths, the, the, the machinery of death, whether it's through the death penalty whether it's through police and extrajudicial killings, whether it's through the policy of violence and, 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 and displacement, that even in the midst of all of this, we declare, decree, and confess that, God, you are still at work. Whether it is our consciousness and our awareness of all of the many ways in which COVID-19 persists, that these variants that continue to uh, crop, pop up and, and, and gestate in our society and in our culture that the United States uh, hit a threshold uh, this past uh, week of, I think, or, or Friday, over 4,000, almost 4,000 new cases, one of the highest since February 2021, that in all of this, in spite of this, we have to continue to confess that, God, you are a hands-on God and you are at work. That the, the deaths that continue to, to, to play themselves out all across the country, young men overwhelmed by desperation, anger, recklessness, despair, uh, are, are, are falling victim to the, the lethal violence and robberies and, and jackings. That, that even in the midst of all of this, we continue to confess that, God, you still have your hands in the mix. I was talking with some folks about the Oakland Public Schools and all of the challenges happening there and some of our congregation members, our teachers in this system. Uh, we see challenges in the Berkeley Public Schools. We see challenges all across the board. And, and in a time when we are seeing this and wondering, God, have you forsaken us? I want you to know and to be clear that in spite of this, we continue to hold fast to the confession 
that God, your hands are at work. I was struck by the first day of Black History Month. Uh, there were uh, bombing threats at the HBCUs the second day of Black History Month. Uh, Brother Flores in the NFL put a lawsuit out. The third day of Black History Month, they're burning books down in Tennessee because they are uh, worked up uh, through the propaganda of the right and conservative forces about uh, critical race theory, a legal and, and academic framework to help uh, structure the, the, the kinds of discrimination and racism that is systemic and, and acknowledge that the history the right memory and remembering of these uh, violations are actually that which help us to dismantle the future reenactment of such wickedness. Uh, we see in the debates crop up all across the country where people are asking for more cops versus the scaling up of public health interventions related to violence and healing is starting to be pushed to the periphery once again. In the midst of all of this, I found comfort in this passage that, God, I can pray to you in the midst of all of this and ask you not to forsake the work of your hands. Part of why I think it's so important for you and I in this moment to pray this prayer as we are seeking rest and healing and refreshing and renewal and restoration is because when we can pray this prayer, we are literally reaffirming and we are convincing and reminding ourselves that in spite of everything that goes on in my life, God, I am, we are, the world is, history is an extension of the work of your hand. And it's got to be quite a blessing to know that we are not in a free fall when it comes to the history of our struggle. We are not in a free fall when it comes to the day-to-day -day journey of our lives. That in spite of all that's happening, God, your hands are still at work among us. And when we forget that God's hands are at work, we can fall victim to a form of fantasy that robs us of the ability to have veracity in the trust that God will make God's purposes fulfilled concerning us. One writer says that this psalm powerfully captures and describes that those who live close to God are living in reality. And those who trust in human power are living in a world of fantasy. Can you imagine, child of God, what it would look like for us, in spite of all that's happening, to continue through our practices and our, 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 our confessions and our prayers to say, God, can I continue to draw close to you? Can I continue to ground myself in the reality that is God versus the fantasy that is this world fading away? As we enter Black History Month, I can't help but ask you and ask me and think uh, of all social uh, moments and, and history and society. Are we seeking reality or fantasy as a way forward? Are we asking and and beckoning for the reality of God's kingdom, kingdom, God's purposes on earth as it is in heaven. Now, clearly, history is, is, is not always fixed in its telling. History is often told by powerful storytellers, people who spend money uh, that is uh, mind-boggling to try and capture a narrative and control a narrative. And unfortunately, uh, those who choose to misremember history create futures born of falsities. That mendacity can become the characterization of a world yet created. But I believe that black history, along with all these moments throughout the year, give you and I an opportunity to tell different stories, to excavate the narratives that are often suppressed, to, 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 to recapture those figures that 
have been erased to 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 figure out ways for our history to become a compass in in, in uh, 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 one of our Swahili, uh, it is called Sankofa, the idea that I look back in order to know which way to move forward. Carter G. Woodson, uh, he is the originator of the Black History Week, which uh, became and was expanded to Black History Month. He says that the greatest cause of human suffering is forgetfulness. The greatest cause of human suffering is forgetfulness. And so while you and I, we face powerfully profound and significant problems in our contemporary moment, we, because we forget our history, we are not able to draw water from the rich wells of spirit, the rich wells of culture, the rich wells of story and narrative that reside within the history of our ancestors who were able to accomplish so much more than the, 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 the accomplishments that we have, even though they had much less. And because we forget history, and because we have forgotten where we come from, we buy into the fantasy of American exceptionalism, the fantasy of capitalistic achievement, the fantasy of positional titles and, 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 and spaces without authority and the ability to determine that which is just and right. I want you to know, child of God, that reality is that which God's hands are forging through our participation. Reality is that when God uh, it, it begins a work and then creates a little uh, space for you and I to come alongside God and bring our hands into the work that God is already beginning to work out. I mean, this is why I love Black History Month or any of these moments of memorial, because they often allow you and I to eschew the temptation to live ahistorically. They challenge you and I to not be people who forget that God has been at work. To forget that God is still at work. To forget that God is working through us. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, God is working through me. God is working through me. You ought to just holler at your neighbor in the chat. Call out a name and say, neighbor, God is working through you. And Black History Month at its best cannot be reduced to a series of symbolic gestures. They like to gaslight all of us into thinking that those who are actively trying to diminish the history and the futures of black folk and other marginalized groups just because they can pull out a name and, and promote a speech, but actively they are stealing our right to vote. Actively, they are limiting our access to capital and resources. Actively, they are literally expanding wicked police forces while diminishing the work that could reimagine public safety. I don't need a symbolic gesture during Black History Month. What I need is evidence that God's hands are working through all of us. Uh, somebody come on, holler, all hands on deck, all hands on deck. And that's why you and I have to realize that memorials like Black History Month, they're opportunities as a spiritual practice to have social memory. Social memory is important in the lives of we, the people of God, because social memory allows us to have moments where we can remind ourselves that repentance is always in order. Social memory reminds us that confession is always in order. Social memory reminds us that there are moments where we can put bookmarks in our story and remember that our journeys are never linear. Our journeys are never in a straight line, but that they are often squiggly and spiraling, that our journeys are often all over the place, but God's steady hand comes on in. Do I have a witness that can declare that I've had a little bit of a rough, squiggly, spirally journey, but God's hands have always been through my history? Lord, help me in here today. 
God. I can look back and I can say, God, it was you that was there all of the time. God, it was you that carried me through the fire. God, it was you that carried me through the flood. It was you that carried me through my most difficult moments. And memorials are important because when done well, they reorient us to the reality of God's active work in our histories. That's why, you know, as I thought about this passage and as I thought about the work of God's hands in us, I began to look through scripture and to see the many ways that the practice of memorials was an important way of preserving history in the multi-millennia journey of the Hebrews and Israelites and, and Gentiles and now us who have said that through these memorials we're going to keep a lineage of storytelling and history memor memory in place so we don't have to be wandering, losing the conviction that God is at work. You will find God calling out to the children of Israel, build an altar, build a memorial. And you find through scripture memorials being often described in several ways. Memorials were often spoken, meaning that they had a testimony, a liturgical remembrance. They, they were confessed through psalms and prayers as a memorial so they could remember God's faithfulness. A memorial was done through practices, through the ways in which they had to act towards the widow and the orphan, in ways they had to act towards the oppressed and those who were left out of the, the social uh, well-being of society. The practices of them having to continue to live into this idea that God has been kind to us. So because God's kindness to me has been perpetual, my kindness to others must also be the same. Memorials lived through altars and monuments. They had these moments with God and said, you know, I can't leave this place without building an altar, without building a monument. I have to plant a flag here so, so I can always come back to this place in my life and realize that there was a physical moment in my journey where if it had not been for God, I'd have lost. Or memorials are preserved in the way people live. I can recall Jesus uh, talking about the woman who had so much faith. And Jesus said her life will be a memorial for all to remember what faith looks like. So memorials are spiritual practices that can be spoken words. They can be practices. They can be altars or they can be the lives that have been lived well. And I want you to know, child of God, that you and I, as an act of seeking rest, healing, and refreshing, must take seriously the need to have memorials, to remember history, to reflect on that which God has done so we can be clear about what God is doing. And one of the greatest memorials we have as followers of Jesus is communion. Today we will remember we will act in memorial of the body and the blood of Jesus that was given on our behalf why because for thousands of years we confess and remember this sacrifice why because people said that we will remember I want you to know child of God that this memory of you and I must be a chief uh, practice and discipline if we are indeed to find rest for our weary souls. Just like communion through the broken body and the shed blood reminds us that God can work through broken pieces. That God can work through the sacrifice that we make. I want you to know that this communion also reminds us that the presence of the Holy Spirit can turn our brokenness and our sacrifice into unifying, healing, transcendent power that calls you and I into the active work of God in the world. Oh, yes, child of God. 
memory, memorial, sacramental practices, they never just bring power to ourselves, but they are also unleashing and unlocking the power to bring it elsewhere. And this is why all hands on deck, God's activity through God's hands, our partnering with God through our hands. It is a perpetual inhaling and exhaling activity of God in the world, in you, in our families, in our communities. And I want you to think about what does it mean to pray to God? Lord, do not forsake the work of your hands. In my life, don't forsake the work of your hands. What does it mean during this month of celebrating and remembering our journey as African people? God, do not forsake the work of your hands. What does it mean when we are dealing with the injustices in the world? God, do not forsake the work of your hands. What does it mean we're dealing with the transitions and the challenges in our children, in our families, in our communities? God, do not forsake the work of your hands. I declare that just that prayer alone, it causes you and I to rightly remember that God, you are a hands-on God. You are a God who is able uh, to, 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 to make a priority the things that concern me. You are a God who is able to empower us as agents in the world to work alongside your hands. And so, God, my prayer is, Lord, don't forsake the work of your hands. And so as I, as I wind this down, I, I want to give you some scriptures that can help you and I appreciate, number one, that God is working to right wrongs. That's what it means when God is, is, is working through the world. God creates with everything being enough in humanity uh, through our exploitation and our own inward curved desires that are not rightly formed. Take the enough and turn it to scarcity. And that Enough being turned to scarcity is what produces injustice. That enough being turned into scarcity is what produces greed. That enough being turned to scarcity is what produces war and violence. And so the work of God in the world is to right the wrongs. I want you to know that our history has shown us that we have always been a people who were conscious of the transcendent God. Exodus chapter 10 verse 17 says, For the Lord your God is the God of all gods and the Lord of all lords, the great, the mighty, the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. This God executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows love for the alien by giving them food and clothing. So show your love for the alien, for you were once aliens in the land of Egypt. Psalms 103 verse number 6 says the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Psalms 33 verse 5, the Lord loves righteousness and justice and the earth is full of God's unfailing love. Psalms 103, verse 6, the Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. Proverbs 21, 15, when justice is done, it brings joy to the righteous, but terror to evildoers. Psalms 140 and 12, I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and justice for the poor. I want you to know what is God doing? God is actively working in the world to right the wrongs of injustice. And because God is working, I want you to know that God invites us now to work. What does the scripture tell you and I to do? Well, this is what you and I must do to bring our hands into the work that is God's. God tells us in Psalms 82 verse 3, give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. God is doing God's work, but God is also telling you to do some things. Isaiah verse 1 verse 17, learn to do good. Some of us need to put that in the chat. I got to learn to do good. 
<laughs> yes, Lord. Lord knows I, I got to learn some things because I've been taught to do bad. <laughs> Somebody say amen. I've been taught to be a hater. I've been taught to be jealous. I've been taught uh, to be envious. I've been taught uh, to be a, a hoarder. I've been taught uh -huh, to be an abuser. But God is telling you and I learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's cause. Uh, uh, the scripture is telling us to do some more things. Micah 6, 8. God has told you, oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. All you, all you, all you righteous folk, God, Jesus called you some Pharisees. Luke chapter 11, verse 42. This is what Jesus says to all us righteous folk, all us spiritual folk, all us folk who got it all together. Jesus speaks to us and he says, but woe to you Pharisees. For you tithe mint and ruin every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Uh, I hear God saying, I'm a both and type of God. I don't want you to give me your money and then be unjust. God says, I don't want you to be unjust and not give me your money. God says, I want you to give me everything that is mine. And I want you to work in the reality that is justice. Do you hear that child of God, that God is working and inviting us to work with God? God is inviting us into the transcendent work that is God, the work of God's hands in history, the work of God's hands in the world. The work of God's hands also extend to us. And that's the last thing I'll spend some time talking about. That God is not just working to right wrongs in the world, but God is also working to right wrongs in us. Oh, come on, pat yourself on the chest and say, God is working to heal me. God is working to, to restore me. God is working to refresh me. That the work of God requires an all hands on deck approach. Not just out there in the world, but also within us. And my question to you, child of God, is what is it that God is doing to heal you? Hallelujah. What is it that God is doing to correct that within you and I that we know needs correcting? What is the trauma, the anger, the pain, the fear that has happened in our lives that God is saying it's an all hands on deck moment in your life, in your family, in your relationships, with your children, with your vocation. It's an all hands on deck moment that we create history through the work of God in us, not just out there in the world. Jeremiah 30, 17, the scripture says that God says, I will restore you to health and heal your wounds, declares the Lord. You ought to just say to yourself, God, restore my health and heal my wounds. Isaiah 57 says, I have seen their ways, but God says, I will heal them. I will guide them and restore comfort to the mourners. I will create praise on their lips, peace. Peace to those far and near, and I will heal them. You ought to ask yourself, God, even though my ways may not please you at times, God, I still need you to heal me. I still need you to work on me. I need your hands to be at work on my life with my hands at work. It's Jeremiah 33, 6, nevertheless, I will bring health and healing I will heal my people and I will let them enjoy abundant peace and security. I've had to read that verse to myself and to so many of us working on peacemaking work all across the country. Because sometimes it is hard for us to do the work of peacemaking and healing when we ourselves are constantly under the onslaught of trauma, anger, fear, and pain. But I hear God saying, I will bring peace. I will bring health. I will bring healing to you. You ought to just pat yourself on the chest and say, God, I need you to bring peace and healing to me, to my family, to my community.
I love this with Jeremiah 17, 14. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me, and I will be saved. Woo, I dare you just this week, in your moment of despair, when you're feeling overwhelmed, just holler out, heal me, Lord, and I will be healed. When you're feeling yourself drowning in the despair of the circumstances of your life. I dare you, don't be ashamed. Holler out, save me, Lord. And I will be saved. Child of God, it is indeed the case that God is working to heal you. God is working to heal us. God has no desire to leave us without healing and peace and wellness. Oh, last thing, if God is working to heal us, I want to ask you a hard question. What are you doing to heal yourself? How are you restoring balance to your life? I was reading... Uh, my therapist was talking to me about my uh, sleep deprivation. I, I, I have these wild sleep patterns. I go to sleep, wake up at 2 in the morning, can't go to sleep back till 4. And, and you know, she was sharing with us and me, well, not uh, sharing with me about how sleep uh, patterns can dictate your, arc, uh, what was the word, I think, uh, circadian rhythms that, 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 that help to influence your mental health, your in, endocrine, your, your gut systems, your, your, your immune systems. And, 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 and it, it, even though I've been working out and, and doing all these other things, that, that I have to regulate my, my sleeping patterns because it can even mess with, listen to this, my memory. It could trigger dementia and other forms of mental incapacities. A lack of sleep, a lack of having balance, a lack of being able to allow my body and spirit to be at rest and to recharge can actually impact my memory. Lord, I, 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 I thought about the many ways in which our lives have become so out of balance because of the, the ways in which we have forgotten our own history, forgotten our own ways of balance and healing. And we've bought into this Eurocentric, post-Christian, post-religious, post-human, technocratic world. We have th thought that we can manipulate time and manipulate uh, uh, the environment. We can manipulate people. We can manipulate systems. But all the while, that which has been in put in us as a memorial of our contingency, that, that circadian system, that biological clock, that which seeks and creates equilibrium and balance. The hard question my therapist asked me, I now ask you, how are you healing yourself? How are you restoring balance to your life through the memorials that we can create? God, I can create balance through the spoken practices, but through the spoken words. I can create balance through the practices, my daily practices. I can create balance through the altars and the monuments that I, I, I construct. I can create balance through the lives that are lived well that I model my life after. Child of God, it is an opportunity. For us to be healed by God, but for us also to put our hands into the healing process. It's an all hands on deck moment for us to remember history, for us to participate in the justice work of God, for us to celebrate and tell the right stories, for us to participate in the healing work of God in the world. And in us, it's an all-hands-on-deck moment. It's a both-and. It's not an either-or. It's an invitation. And may we say yes to the invitation that is God's extended hands. May we say yes 
May we join God's work. May we say like David, God, do not forsake the work of your hands. Oh, God, we need your help. We need you, God, to stabilize us. We need you, God, to remind us that you are still at work. That even among all that concerns us, Lord, you will not forsake the work of your hands. That you are building. You are healing. You are restoring. You are creating. And so, God, may the work of your hands provide space for our hands to do your will and your way. I pray for every person on the sound of my voice today, God. I pray, God, that they will remind themselves and remember that your word is true, that you are God, that you are at work. Give us what we need for this season. Give us what we need for this time. Give us what we need, Lord God, so we may find life and life abundantly. Bless every person who is not in relationship with you. We invite, Lord, those who must say yes to your will and to your way, yes to the salvation that is offered, God. We invite them to say yes. We invite them to receive the gift that is salvation, the gift that is redemption, the gift that is spiritual healing for the soul, the mind, and the body. We invite them, oh God, to become a part of this redeemed community of Christ followers. May they say yes to you, oh God, in Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you, people of the way. We love you with the love of the Lord. We love you so much. Listen, people of God, all hands on deck this week, all hands on deck this month, this year. May we participate with God. May we partner with God. May we never forget that God will fulfill the works of God's hands. And we have our hands to give to God. God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord, people of the way. Stay connected in all the many ways and we'll see you in Jesus' name.